Good morning and welcome to this edition of San Diego People. I'm Sandra Moss. Mental health is a growing issue across the globe. Assemblyman Brian Mainshine is working on fixing the issue in the state of California. He's introduced three bills that focus on helping people with mental health issues. Two of the bills specifically focus on maternal mental health and the other one on psychiatry. He's here now to tell us more about it. Good to see you. Hi, Sandra. Mental health mm -hmm. is uh, such a big issue, not only in California, but worldwide. And there are so many reasons for it. It affects so many people. And yet it seems that there are very or not enough resources devoted to treating it. Yeah, all, all across the spectrum. There's not enough money. There's not enough mental health professionals. There's not enough services. There's not enough coordination. This is a huge, huge problem. As you said, it, 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 nationwide, I mean, obviously I'm up at the state level, so I'm focused on California. But nationwide, nearly 80% of counties have severe shortages uh, of psychiatrists and mental health providers. 55% of counties have none. And so this is, a, this is a, such a complex problem, and we don't have the resources in place to address it. Why are people so uninterested in uh, learning more or becoming involved in psychiatry, do you it, think? It's really amazing what I've learned. You know, I was the homeless commissioner for San Diego County, and it's really where I first kind of got up close and personal with these mental health issues. The homeless people uh, that we were helping and, and trying to help, it, almost 100% of the long-term chronic homeless have mental illness, and, and a lot of it's pretty severe mental illness. And it's really at the root of a, a crime, it's at the root exactly. of substance abuse, and it's at, at the root of, as you mentioned, homelessness. You're exactly right. A lot of our substance abuse problems are people who have mental illness who are self-treating, right? They're treating themselves with drugs and alcohol, which then exacerbates their problems. Our homeless who are out on the streets, it's hard to get them into shelter and get them into services when they have mental health issues. So that's where I first became interested in it and, and really saw how widespread the societal problems that result from mental health. And I and I will tell you, I agree with you, it's kind of been frustrating since I got elected to the state assembly that there's a, there really hasn't been a focus on something that I see as so integral uh, to California is health, mental health, and all these other societal problems that we have. Well, you have been a very busy man in the assembly with these three bills. Let's yeah. go over them right now. Sure. There are three of them. Uh, let's start with the uh, the, um, the the maternal ones that yeah. uh, you talked to, to, two of them. So I have two maternal mental health bills. The first one, the, the federal government has provided funding, which is, as you and I said earlier in this segment, is so important, right? We need the money here in California. They've provided funding for maternal mental health issues. The state of California, incredibly, had never applied for this funding. Why? Yeah, isn't that amazing? There's money available and we haven't even applied for it. So my bill would A, require the state of California to apply for the funding. Mm -hmm. Assuming we get the funding, then it would require the Department of Public Health to provide their plan, what are they going to do with it, right? There, are they, and I would suggest telehealth, increased screening, public education programs, all of that should be part of it. Um, so it's kind of a two-pronged uh, 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 solution to this pr this maternal mental health problem that we could get some funding and then what what would we the state do with it that's the first bill okay and then the assembly bill 1893 that one's 1893 so okay. 2193 which is the second one would require uh, all women to be after they've had a baby right. to be screened for postpartum depression they're right? not right now no it's a standard, of, it is the standard of care, it's recognized as a standard of care that all women should be, but it's not happening. And so my bill would require every single woman post, uh, po uh, after their pregnancy is postpartum, postpartum mm -hmm. uh, they would have to be screened by their doctor. That's the first part of that. The second part of that is then in conjunction with the health plan, they'd have to come up with a case management plan for any woman who was determined to be depressed, uh, have postpartum depression. And it's something that affects a lot of pregnant women after they deliver, right? Almost 25% of women. Wow. And for women in poverty, it's about 50%. And a lot of these women are undiagnosed and exactly. it results in tragedy and big problems. And, and it can range from kind of low-level anxiety to really severe, severe problems. And, and women, especially first-time pregnant women, they don't understand. They, they may be saying to themselves, I feel more emotional or I'm, I'm you know, acting in a way that I'm unfamiliar with, but, but that must be normal. But then they realize that down the road that, oh my gosh, these problems were very serious. And the effect on the kids we found that 
long term for the kids that don't have that bonding that may may not be occurring they may have the, the moms having some other issues that may affect feeding or some other things those kids have very long term repercussions the education levels down so this is something that if we get at the root cause of it which is screening to diagnose it so it doesn't go undiagnosed. And then secondly, with these women, w w there needs to be a plan in place for these women once they are diagnosed. And then the third one has to deal with, uh, deals with general mental health overall, getting more yeah. people into psychiatry or encouraging students to, to study that, Exactly. Right? We, we have a severe shortage of psychiatrists. And then when psychiatrists, the ones that do get out of school, it's not uncommon for them in California to have $200,000 or so worth of debt. So there are currently in place some debt forgiveness uh, and loan repayment programs already in place in California. What my bill would do would be to expand it for psychiatrists who are going to serve a, a county mental health plan, so serve these very troubled areas, these, these populations that you and I have been talking about. They would be now eligible for some loan forgiveness because we want to encourage people who want to go into psychiatry to a go into it right they right. may they may think it's too expensive but then b once they go into it we want them to serve our county mental health plans because if, particularly in san diego county these homeless individuals you're, you've talked about earlier those people will be affected by this if we can get more psychiatrists to treat them we can do something for them it sounds kind of like a template that the army or u.s military uses right they yep. they give loans or they forgive loans as long as the uh people serve in our army forces. Exactly. The military has been smart to this for a long time. They know that if we want to get people in, this is a powerful incentive to get people into our program. This is the, the, taking that same approach is if we can forgive some debt for these people, we'll get more of them. So um, where are these bills in the process? Why would anybody be against them? Is this something that's going to cost ta taxpayers more money? Oh, tell us about that. Well, first off, I've learned that there's always somebody opposed. No matter what you do, you take these bills that you see are, as so righteous and so helpful, uh, and there still always becomes somebody who's opposed to them. Having said that, I think we've worked through some of the opposition. No, it's, it's, this, it's not going to cost taxpayers more money. In fact, for example, with the first bill, if we apply, if we just apply for that grant funding from the federal right, government, that's just an we'll get ask. more money. It's just an ask, yeah. and and it and it would bring a lot more money into it. Secondly, and then it would provide a plan from there. Um, requiring screening is a very minimal impact on a doctor who's already treating a woman uh, postpartum. And would this be covered by insurance? Yeah, and so that we, and we've worked with the health plans, yes, to make sure that it is covered by insurance, and that we work with the health plans to make sure that we're providing it, that they pro help provide in conjunction with the doctor mm -hmm. a case management program that matches these women with the resources to help them. So follow up as well. Exactly. Well, very interesting. All right, we're going to talk more uh, about um, maternal mental uh, health issues in uh, the state of California and also more, uh, more about the uh, psychiatry issue that right. is facing our state as well when we come right back on San Diego People. Stay with us. And just to, to recap, three bills you're actually mm -hmm. dealing with, dealing with uh, mental health, they're going to be uh, voted on next month? Yes. So we've gotten them through the assembly committees. We've got them through the assembly floor. Next is through Senate committees and the Senate floor, and then ultimately uh, to Governor Brown's desk to be signed. I'm optimistic that we're going to get them through. We've, I think we've worked through some of the potential issues, and now everything seems to be uh, full speed ahead, and we're going to get these through. All right. We're going to be watching that very carefully. Um, we're focusing right now on um, so the maternal mental health bills and yeah. more broadly maternal mental health. Gretchen, um, you've been a therapist, and you started out your career as a social worker mm -hmm. where you really discovered there was a, uh, a lack of care when it came to maternal mental health. Yeah, well, uh, like Assemblymember Mainsheim was mentioning in his discoveries on the Homeless Task Force, that there was this deep correlation between mental illness and chronic homelessness. I started out my field in child welfare and worked in child protective services and was working in going into families where there was concerns going on. And what I found consistently was that it typically stemmed from untreated mental health issues, untreated um, issues of poverty and a lack of resources on the part of the parent. And so I became really committed and interested in how we help serve children and keep children well and healthy actually through the medium of the parent. Mm -hmm. And how would you say, how uh, severely is San Diego County lacking when it comes to resources that deal with maternal mental health? 
Well, you know, I, I was a board member for Postpartum Health Alliance, which is a local nonprofit that actually helps um, providers and family members locate qualified providers who can treat pregnancy and postpartum related mental health disorders. And what I found in my time working in that issue was that there's a number of amazing programs and a number of amazing providers here locally. The challenge is that they're not necessarily connected. We don't have a connected infrastructure and system. We have a lot of isolated, wonderful, dedicated people or programs or organizations that understand this issue. But they're really working in separate silos. So what we really need um, is, and that this legislation can help with, is to kind of create a central point, a central access point that can help link those different points in the interventions that are needed and of course diagnosing postpartum depression is yeah. um, at the forefront of all of that yeah. what how do you diagnose that and uh, yeah. as uh, we talked about 25% yeah. of pregnant women end up having that disorder yeah so postpartum depression is um, very misunderstood um, firstly there's sort of an allergic reaction to it when you try to talk to people about it they want nothing to do with it I was at a resource fair one time and I stood at the table and watched how people went table to table and when they got to ours they kind of went wide Right, so there's an aversion to it. It's what an uncomfortable topic. I think it's a really frightening topic. I think it overwhelms people. Um, I think the idea of not being at your best at such a critical and personal time. You know, motherhood is something, and parenthood, because this is affecting fathers too, this is something we long dream about. I think it's um, really painful to think of not being your best for your children, and so... Um, some actually choose to kind of avoid it, avoid the topic, and think that won't be me. Almost as if it's a personal failing, um, but it's not a personal failing. And so when people say that won't be me, they're actually preventing themselves from knowing what they need to know to stay above water. And it's really a, a crashing of the hormones that a woman has no control yeah. over. Yeah, that's, um, there's actually a multitude of things that can contribute, but that's certainly one of them. And so um, the, the bill, the legislation that encourages for screening, you know, one, it's been recommended by ACOG, the Academy of um, the, the American College of Obstet Obstetricians and Gynecologists. It's a very difficult. I like ACOG. It's okay, easier. I like that too. Um, so ACOG and AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the United States Preventive Services Task Force. All these very um, well resourced, well thought out, evidence driven organizations have recommended that screening be done during pregnancy or in the postpartum period. So we know it's needed. Um, the beauty of screening, the importance of it, is screening isn't the same as diagnosis. Because so just because someone is screened and there's some positive markers, which means all that means is they were asked some questions. It's not a blood test. It's not anything intrusive. It's a conversation to ask about certain experiences that the woman or the man is having, or that they've noticed a drop in their own functioning or well-being. And after that, it points them to the fact that maybe there's some support or intervention needed. But the beauty of screening that's so helpful is that it's also education. When you screen, you educate a woman or a family about what might be happening for them and it starts to raise their awareness of it. You're also raising awareness amongst providers. When you ask providers to screen, there's, there's some interesting research, the numbers I can't cite very well, but there was this interesting study where they, they looked at women in the health system and they asked them, have you been screened? And, and a huge percentage said no. And in that same health system, they asked providers if they were screaming and they also, screening and they all said yes. So there's this divide between the experience people are having and what providers think they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so when we make it really deliberate, it increases awareness. Right. And how did you become aware of this? And why are you so passionate about these bills? You're a man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, you know, I, I do think it's something that help, it, it impacts all people in a family. It impacts the wife. It impacts the husband. You know, so many of these mental health issues, particularly postpartum depression, people think that, oh, if I just push through, I'm just a little tired. You know, the baby's not sleeping. It must just be that I'm tired. And, some, and a lot of times it's much more than that. You know, my experience as both a father and then my experience working as the homeless commissioner really have made me very passionate passionate on the topic of mental health. Give us a laundry list, Gretchen, of mm -hmm. symptoms of postpartum depression and how is it treated and how successful is treatment? So glad you asked that. So one of the problems, with the barriers to getting people into care for postpartum depression is it's kind of a misnomer. What we know now is actually another terrible acronym, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. And what that refers to is that the mental health spectrum that can hit during and after pregnancy can occur during pregnancy or after pregnancy up to a year. It can involve depression, anxiety, it can involve intense irritability in patients, anger. Many women will feel angry towards people they love otherwise and they're very confused by that. 
Um, it's very distressing and alienating to them, and they personalize it when it's actually just a symptom. Um, and then there's, of course, postpartum psychosis, which happens in very rare cases, but those are the headlines we hear about. About mothers who kill their babies. About, um, yeah, extreme behavior during and after, or after pregnancy. It really is isolated to after pregnancy. What is the treatment for postpartum depression or the spectrum of issues that could happen? So it's really a continuum. For some women, if we catch them early, um, it really is just about education and awareness and teaching them how to invite more support. Maybe they want to get a little more sleep intervention. Maybe they want to ask for more support from family. A lot of women think they need to do it alone. And so um, asking for more support can help. If that's not enough, it can involve therapy. It can involve support groups. Um, there's, a, there's a spectrum and it really depends on what they need. And then it can involve medication. A pregnancy lasts for nine months. Um, how often or how long does treatment typically last to treat postpartum depression? This is why the legislation is so important. The earlier you get in, the shorter the term of treatment. So the longer a woman waits to be recognized, the stronger the symptoms can become and the longer it can take to really start to remit and remedy it. Um, but really treatment can take anywhere from a matter of six weeks to a couple of years, depending on how strong the symptoms get before they get help. So interesting and so important. And um, yeah. for women who want a resource on how to find out more information yeah. about the issue, where do they go? Oh, please go to Postpartum Health Alliance. It's a San Diego nonprofit. We, are, we have a directory of therapists, psychiatrists, doctors, and um, other support providers that are all trained in and very sensitive to this issue. And we will have Postpartum Alliance's link on the yes. KUSI yes. website. And if you're just joining us, the reason we're talking about all this is because Assemblyman Mainshine has, uh, he's sponsoring three very important mental health bills. And one of them is, of course, um, regarding postpartum depression and helping women yeah. in San Diego. It, it's so critical. And I think one of the things we really want to reinforce is ask for help. There is help out there. Uh, ask for it. One of the, the other thing too is when when we know these women need help, it's so important to have a comprehensive plan, and that's one thing that we're really trying to work on with these bills is putting these women in a place where they have the resources available to them and they know where to go. Very interesting. All right, you're both going to stick around for a, a little bit longer. When we look at a pie chart. Um, and uh, in, in, in relation to illnesses, uh, how much of a big piece of that pie deals with mental illness? Oh, it's huge. It's a huge percentage. And the, the reason for this bill is that we need more people to go into s mental health services. And yes, we want a lot of them to go into postpartum uh, issues, but also all the other ones, schizophrenia, all these other ones, people who are homeless, all those, we need more psychiatrists in all those fields because, for example, if you are a woman suffering from postpartum depression and you call, you, you get, you, you realize you have a problem, you mm -hmm. get diagnosed, you realize you, you're screened, you're diagnosed, you realize you have a problem, you're reaching out for services and you get told, wait a minute, I, I, can't, you can't get, I can't get you an appointment for six weeks. Well, that person doesn't have six weeks to wait. There's going to be a lot of serious issues that could come up if they have to wait six weeks. So they may never get treatment, or that may be too long. So what I want to see is I want to see more people go into this field. That way there's way more resources for all the people that need mental health services. And by forgiving some debt for these people, we know, just like you said earlier with your example, which was so good with the military, when you forgive debt for these individuals, it does attract people, and we need to be doing that in this state. And Gretchen, as a, uh, a therapist, as a social worker early in your career, you really saw this firsthand, mm. the, the need for and um, some of the serious um, consequences of people not getting the help that's out there. Yeah, it can be really tragic. Um, you know, the reality is is that when we are well, we, we're driven to fulfill a purpose. We want to be productive. We want to contribute. We want to raise our families. We, we want to go about life. We want to be normal. And when mental illness interferes, I think the important thing, the, the way that I see it is, I think of mental illness as a functional disorder, right? Anytime you have a mental illness in place in somebody's mind and body, you are taking away degrees of their function. Right? So they, they're removed from the opportunity to participate in society, participate in life, participate in relationships. And the degree to which they are just depends on how severe the mental illness is. And when it's not caught early and treated, the amount of intervention that's needed or their willingness to get into treatment significantly worsens with time. So we need to catch people early and we need the awareness and the understanding out there. And we also need more students to study in that field. Yeah. Uh, typically, um, they graduate, uh, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, with some heavy debt. Yeah. 
Yeah, they do. And that makes it harder to have them serve in any mental health capacity, but particularly with counties. Again, if you look at what we're talking about is serving some people either in poverty, ser serving some people uh, with other issues you talked about earlier, maybe drug and alcohol issues, serving postpartum issues, which we need a lot more because it does need to be, uh, as Gretchen said, so timely. We need more service providers there to help these individuals. And the longer we wait, we know the problems exacerbate because we know, for example, that that might lead to drug or alcohol problems. It might lead to more relationship problems because as their mental health issue de deteriorates, right. then that causes problems with the, the, their safety net, their mm -hmm. structure, maybe with their spouse, maybe with their parents, maybe with their kids. So all of this is so interrelated and it becomes mm -hmm. more and more problematic down the road. You know, I, I find it so interesting if um, somebody has a, a problem with their heart or their kidney, um, they're so willing to, to talk yeah. about it and share with the, uh, my heart, you know, I have this issue, I have, a, I have a brain tumor, I have strep throat or whatever. But yet, the, the most important uh, organ is our mind. And exactly. we are so reluctant to concede that there is some sort of a problem. That stigma is still there. Yeah. Why? You know, I don't really understand. I, I don't have the answer to that. I, ha I only have the answer to how we move away from it. Um, I just know that the more we raise awareness about what is health and our pathways to health, mm -hmm. the more people are willing to embark on that. Yeah. I don't know why people are so avoidant of acknowledging I, I also it. heard a statistic recently that uh, it was a study that was done related to Rady Children's Hospital that mm. showed that, and we can follow up on this, mm -hmm. that San Diego County mm. has the highest rate of adolescent suicide mm. in all of California. Mm. I was astounded to yeah. hear that. It was yeah. somebody affiliated with Rady Children's Hospital. Mm -hmm. And people mm -hmm. need to talk about it. People shouldn't be embarrassed. Yeah. Even something like you doing this show on this yeah. is so helpful because yeah. women he that are watching this say here, wait a minute, it's 25% of women yeah. that are affected by this? That's a lot. I'm not alone. This, this affects a lot. Uh, they, they don't feel either embarrassed or maybe I'm weak yeah. or maybe I need to push through. Some of the things that traditionally have kept people from going to get help yeah. exactly you mentioning those suicide statistics maybe there's a teen out there who right. hears that and says wait a minute actually I do need to make a call now this isn't just me this is a whole lot of people that are affected by this right and the asking for help is tough I mean we've seen some very high profile very successful people that had everything to live for um, kill themselves in very horrific ways celebrities yeah. recently and yeah. that kind of wow that just jolts you too doesn't it Gretchen yeah well I think it's so important to remember that what killed them was an altered state of mind Depression killed them. Yeah. Untreated depression killed them. So the only reason a person takes that action is because they're not in a right state of mind. They're not healthy and they haven't gotten access to care or the care that they got wasn't adequate to intervene on the illness. I think it's important for people who are watching that maybe um, need some help. Uh, there's all kinds of help yeah. and hotlines and things yeah. available that we will have on the KUSI um, website. Uh, we have uh, about 30 seconds. Yeah. Final thoughts on your three bills that uh, will be decided by the Senate uh, next month. Collectively, these are very important, I believe, to the future of California in terms of how we treat mental health in this state. Right now, we don't have enough funding. We don't have enough coordination. Uh, there's not enough, and then, and then the, as Gretchen said earlier, the people are in silos. We need to change all three of those. This will allow us to get more money. It will allow us to have more coordination, and it will get more people into the field of psychiatry, all of which I think will have a long-term significant impact on dealing with mental health in California. Well, we will be following uh, the progress and uh, the very latest of what happens on those bills in the Senate. Assemblyman Mainshine, thank you so much Thanks, for being Sandra. here. Uh, Gretchen Malios, appreciate uh, your you. thoughts as well. Thank you thank both. You. And that is going to do it for this morning's edition of San Diego People. Be sure and join us tonight for the KUSI News at 6, 10, and 11.